Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q and A. Welcome back, Rabbi the Man, the myth, the legend, Tobias Singer. Welcome. <laughs> all right, all right. Great to be here. Good to Great have you to here. Be here. No doubt yeah. about it. No doubt about it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. How was your week so far? Yushalayim, amazing. Jerusalem is wonderful. The weather is crazy. And Lag Bomer is coming tomorrow night, the 33rd day of the Count of the Omer, which is very exciting here all over the Holy Land. You can practice Judaism anywhere, really, but you can only really live it here. And um, everything's exciting. Looking forward this summer to uh, seeing you in Texas. I'll be lecturing in the United States. It's all, all really quite I'm very fortunate, Baruch Hashem. That's awesome. That's awesome. Seats still available, so to speak. So if you guys go to com forward slash events, I'll put that in chat. dot com forward slash events. So actually, I'll have somebody put that in chat for me, if you don't mind. And there we go. So we'll go ahead and kick this off. So our very first question is coming to you now, I think. Let me pause this. And let's get this played. Here we go. Um, yes, this is Michael Tran from Anaheim, California. I'm originally a Catholic, and I always want to know this. Um, what's the deal with Jesus looking like a white man? The reason why I'm asking this is um, I'm assuming that Mary is a Middle Eastern color woman. Did she have an affair with a white person or something? Because Jesus looked white to me, like a European white man. Thank you. That's it. That honestly has never been asked on this show from what I'm aware of. So that's a good question. Yes. Well, <laughs> let's sum it up this way. Christianity is man's failed effort to create God in his image. In contrast, Judaism is God's successful endeavor and creating man in his image. It's really that simple. Now, what would the Europeans, what would the empire, how would they portray God in the flesh? Do you really think that the empire, that the Europeans, would portray God as a black guy? <laughs> it's so crazy. This is really, this is really nutty. I mean, look at how Jesus is characterized, what kind of features he has. I mean, he, he looks, he doesn't look Jewish. He looks, you know, like um, a Viking. He looks like he belongs in a Vogue magazine. You know, he looks like he belongs in a, in a Macy's catalog. Look how, uh, in the Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson, the great luminary of the church. How did Jesus look? He wasn't short. He wasn't bald. He wasn't overweight. He had gorgeous hair. Because that's what you would do if you were going to create your ideal man. I, I lived in Indonesia in the Far East for quite some time. And although Indonesia is very well known as being the largest uh, home to the largest Muslim community in the world. There are some 35 million Christians who live in Indonesia. And what's very striking about the coloring books, the portrayal of Jesus in being Catholic, Protestant, is that Jesus doesn't look like an Indonesian. He looks like a Caucasian guy. He looks like a white guy with a perfect chin. Why? Because if you were going to create God, you would do it in your image. And you would have him to be the ideal guy. Perfect nose. And it's striking that if you look at, like, the cartoons, and I'm not talking about Catholics now, Protestants. You know, they have cartoons about Jesus, Superbook. Look how Jesus is portrayed. Like, why does he have like perfect hair? 
Why? Why isn't he ever bald? Why doesn't he have a receding hairline? Why isn't he ever short? Why, why does he have perfect posture? Why is he blue-eyed? Why? Because this is, this is an insanity where a religion is creating God in his ideal image. I, I remember when I lived in the United States. It goes back a while. But, go, you know, in the United States, when you're checking out of a supermarket, whatever, so they always have magazines, right? They have the magazines when you're checking out. And you look at the people on these magazines, right? Who are they? They're celebrities. They're actors and actresses. And... Or maybe musicians. What, what is something very striking about them? So they're actors, actresses, musicians. They all look great. Is that a coincidence? Why is it that so many musicians, male, female, they look great. Why? They don't look average. Forget the Photoshop. They look great. Because this is, and, and why are they on a magazine? I mean, what is an actor? An actor is only someone who, pretends to be somebody else. They're not even writing their own lines. But that's the that's a void That's pure alien foreign worship. See, it's Christianity that says that God is Jewish, not Judaism. You say that Mary was likely a a black woman. All right, so let me just clue you in on this, and I'm very grateful that you called in. The color means nothing in Judaism. It just doesn't register at all. And the notion that any prophet, well, we, we had prophets like Elisha who was bald, and Moses who was not an eloquent speaker. On the contrary, he had a, a lisp. He was an oral sephosaim, and in fact, he when arguing with God of why he is not worthy to be the leader of the children of Israel, he employed them and said, I'm not, I, I, how am I going to speak on behalf of the children of Israel? So God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher of blessed memory, all right, you'll be like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aharon, who's my great-grandfather, he will be your prophet. So that's fine. That's all good. Well, could David Amel was a redhead. I mean, these things don't matter. These things are just completely unimportant. And I'll say this about a group I'm not very familiar with, but I get it why there would be black men and women who would feel alienated by this. I get that which would trigger these uh, Christian-based or Muslim-based groups that are essentially are angry about this. Now, it's although some of these groups say things that are very striking and very odd, I do get what they're deeply offended by, and that is that Jesus is somehow always a white guy. And I, I, I want to convey that in the Far East, where I spent a considerable amount of time, Jesus, in the coloring books, in the cartoons, he is portrayed as a white guy, a Caucasian guy, not someone with striking Indonesian features, not someone with Asian features, because deep down, no, it, it's, and the Roman Empire, it's not just Jesus. Look at the sculptures of Hercules that have been dug up. What does he look like? What are the all the great philosoph philosophers of Western civilization, what do they look like? The same thing. Right? So now, I know I'm going to get hit with this. I know Protestants will go, we don't believe Jesus. That it's true. Then why is it that all your uh, 
characterizations, the images of Jesus, not in your churches, because Protestants typically would not have a statue or an icon of Jesus. I get that. But your coloring books and your cartoons and your movies and your why is it all Jesus looks this way? Why is he a white guy? How outrageous that God is a white guy, right? So that's where it comes from. Because Baruch Hu loves each and every person, and the color, a person's color, is irrelevant in Judaism. And I'll tell you something I don't think I've ever said to you. You know, I haven't lived in the United States for quite a number of years. And I'm not sure when I see the media, which I do watch American news reports, there's a sense that there's strong racial tension in the United States. I'm not sure if the media is correctly characterizing the racial tension in the United States because it's to their advantage to, um, to heighten tension, to report only when planes don't land safely. So the media is incentivized to, to, to portray conflict. And so may, maybe it's not that way, but it, it surely comes across that the United States is going through a, a difficult time, a challenging time, right? One of the, the nice things here in Israel is that it, it, we have rabbis here who are black, and if I'm in a post office and I see a white guy walk in, I might get nervous. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's a colorblind society. It doesn't mean that there are we don't have crazy people. We do. A few years ago, there was an incident where a couple of nut jobs in Tel Aviv beat up, beat up an Ethiopian. That was headlines all over the country. The country was, was appalled. I'm not saying there are no wackos, but it, it's nice to live in a place where it's just, it's just not an issue. And we thank you so much for your question. All right. That's, that's a great answer. All right. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hello, Rabbi Tovia Singer. My name is Israel. I'm living in Montana. Uh, my question is out of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. It says that Emmanuel will be born of a virgin. So when dealing with the JC topic, I never hear rabbis say, yes, Emmanuel was born of a virgin and he existed and we call and the Christians call him JC or no we don't believe he was born and he never existed and Christianity is just made up so what path do you take on that thank you could you like not hang up that quickly is that possible go ahead could you, could you stay with me yeah, on that's this? Cool. okay go ahead that's stay with me on this so are you familiar with the Hebrew language uh, I am teaching it to my sons currently, as well as I can get it from America uh, oh. through my resources like YouTube, because huh. it, so, this goes into a lot of philosophical debates that I'd love to talk to you about, but if we could just stick on this subject. That's what I'm sticking on. This is very much germane yeah. to this topic. So yeah. look, how do you say a virgin in Hebrew? What's the Hebrew word? Not sure. Please enlighten me. So tell me this. Let me just tell me this. If you're not sure, which is fine, which is fine, then how can you know that the word virgin appears in Isaiah 7, 14? If, please don't be offended if you wouldn't even know what word to look for. That is 100% the truth. I, I can only get through my Hebrew and my concordances or my, or I can only get through my English concordances. Like I can't get through my Hebrew concordance because I don't know the language. Thank you for calling in. I appreciate it. Go ahead and hang up now. Tune in for your answer, okay? Thank you. Thank you. So, as it turns out, in the Hebrew language, both in biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew, 
there is only one way to convey certain virginity, and that is the word betula. Betula means that someone never had sexual intercourse with anyone. This is the word today and the word in the Bible. It's a, a, a word that's found very frequently in the Hebrew scriptures because virginity is very, very important. And as it turns, I mean, that's the key phrase. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, claims that Isaiah 7, 14 prophesizes that behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and Matthew continues, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And you go, well, okay, that's very, that's pretty serious. So what we do then is we always go back to the original, right? You would always go back and check it out, because right? there's a lot at stake. Like if it's said that in Isaiah 7, 14, that would be very significant. If it doesn't say that in Isaiah 7, 14, and the critical word there is virgin, if it doesn't say that, we can then conclude with certainty that whoever wrote the book of Matthew lied about Isaiah, mistranslated the verse, and therefore his credibility collapses along with the credibility of the entire Christian Bible. The Hebrew in Isaiah 7.14 says, L'chein yitain hu, l'chein yitain Hashem hu l'chem os. Hine ho'alma hora v'yedledes bein, v'karas shimo Emmanuel. Behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign. Behold, the young woman. Ha'alma means the young woman. Alma means a young woman. Elem means a young man. A young woman might be a virgin or might she might not be a virgin. In the case of Rebecca in the book of Genesis, she happened to have been a virgin, but the word doesn't mean that. It just, so you're, you, English obviously is your native language. So is the term young woman in English, does that mean a virgin? No, I can say, you see those young women there? They're not virgins, all married women. Or I can say those young women, they're all virgins, right? So there's nothing about the term a young woman that tells us anything about sexual history. It just tells us about their age, they're young, relatively young, and they're female, nothing else. If Isaiah sought to convey virginity, which is what Matthew has in mind in his infancy narrative, by misquoting Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah would have used the word betula. It would say instead, Hine habesula hara v'yele de Spain. The word hara means is pregnant. It's in the perfect tense. It doesn't mean shall be pregnant. What the author of Matthew did was mistranslate a critical passage, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I mean, David, like as in King David, in in 1 Samuel chapter 17, he's called in an Elam, which is the male version of Alma, right? Was he also a virgin? It's really very silly. You, you can have an instance in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 19 and 20, where the word Cain der geva bi Alma, this is the way of a man with a young woman, and the young woman that's in view there is an adulterous woman. And, and like a snake that slithers over a rock rather than sand, like a ship passing through the water, 
And like an eagle flying through the sky, after they pass, they leave no trace, right? So that's how a man is with an Alma. She then engages in illicit sexual, sexual activity. She can just wash herself and say, I've done nothing wrong. There's no way to tell that an adulterous wife has engaged in fornication, right? So the, the word Alma just means a young woman. It does not convey uh, her sexual history, okay? So those are two entirely different words. It is not, this is a very important point, it is not that it is ridiculous, oh, God could not have had a virgin have a baby. That would be a minor miracle in the scale, in the grand scale of the Bible. Parthenogenesis has been observed in the animal world. No, it has not been observed among humans, but Sarah having a baby in her 90s that's a real, that's a much, that's a, that's a real miracle because a female is born with every egg she'll ever have. And when she runs out of eggs, that's it. That's, that was a major miracle. Virgin conceiving. The point is that Matthew has changed the meaning of the passage, removed the definite article. The text really says, Hine ho alma bane. Behold, the young woman is with a child. Matthew changes it to, Behold, a virgin removes the definite article, inserts an indefinite article. Why? Because this conversation that Ahaz is having with Isaiah is 700 years earlier than Christianity. That's why the definite article is removed, is eviscerated, the tense of her pregnancy is changed. The Karachimo Emmanuel, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Well, Matthew can't have that either, so Matthew reads, and they will call his name Emmanuel. One other point uh, I want to bring up, and that's the context of Isaiah 7.14. Like, what's happening in this famous chapter? If, if you would take the time to read Isaiah 7, but not from verse 14, but from verse 1, all the way through, you'd realize immediately this has nothing to do with Christianity. Isaiah 7 is devoted to explaining the Ephro-Syria war that occurred during the Assyrian Empire, where the northern kingdom of Israel, headed by um, Pekach ben Ramal Yahu, the name of the king, northern kingdom, allies himself with the king of Syria, his name is Ritzin, against Malchus Yehuda, the southern kingdom, the king at the time, Ahaz. So you had two kings who wanted to destroy the Davidic dynasty. I, I ask you to just read it, to open up Isaiah 7, but read it in context. Ahaz is not a righteous king, and he's not looking for a sign from God. He wants out. He wants to get out. And sought an alliance with the Assyrian Empire in order to address the problem of how to deal with these two kings that are coming up against him. And in fact, if you go to the next passage, meaning Isaiah 7.15 and the one that follows 7.16, you'll see there that the sign is not even the birth of the child. The sign is the maturity of the child. Isaiah 7, verse 15. Butter and honey will the child eat when he knows to reject enough to reject evil and choose good. I mean, before the child matures, this kid, before he matures, all right, 
what will happen? For before the child knows, verse 16, knows enough to reject evil and choose good, which means he just mature, the land whose two kings you dread, who are the two kings? Pekach ben Ramal Yahu, the king of Israel, northern king of Israel, and Ritzin will be forsaken. So there it is. So if, if you just read it in the Hebrew, you can have a major advantage. You know immediately that Matthew, Matthew has mistranslated this passage, mischaracterized it. Now, I, I'm going to tell you this. It's important for you to know that when you go back to your Christian friends and share with them what I've shared with you, they're going to respond in a number of ways. And I just want to cover a couple of them because I don't want you to be caught off guard. So the the first thing you're going to hear is go back to a pastor, any pastor you want, it doesn't make a difference, and tell them, the, tell them this. So I'll say to you, oh, you don't understand. The Jews are lying here. As it turns out, the pastor will tell you, in the Septuagint, which the missionaries argue was written let's say in the year 256 BCE, roughly 250 years before the advent of Christianity, 72 rabbis, or 70, translated the Hebrew Bible, this is what they're going to say, they translated the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language, and when they came upon Isaiah 7.14, they translated this Hebrew word om as virgin. In Greek, the word is parthenos. Ah, so we see here that even these ancient rabbis who had no axe to grind, writing centuries before the advent of Christianity, they knew to put in the Greek word which conveys virginity. Okay, This is a scam, but it's the kind of scam that if you're not ready for it, well, have you scratch your head and go, oh, that sounds interesting. Okay. So you, you need to know what you're doing. So first, the Septuagint, the original Septuagint, which scholars refer to as the proto-Septuagint, it was only of the five books of Moses, only the Pentateuch, only the law of Moses, nothing else. Okay. So it, this whole um, apologetic is a is a fallacy. It's just complete nonsense. It's a scam. It's like when you're engaging with Christians on this, it's like it's like a magic show, and you just but it's a magic show that's that was performed by your nine year old nephew, where you really know what he's doing. It's not well done. Subsequent to the Septuagint that was created roughly 250 years before the Common Era, many Greek translations of the Bible were created. Of course, the Greek language at the time was the lingo de Franco. So people had an interest in rendering the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. There were so many of them done, including by the church. And what the church did then was baked in to their translations words, Greek words, that would bolster, that would support the criminal behavior of the writers of the New Testament, and then tell you that Matthew relied on the Septuagint, although the Septuagint is nowhere found in the Christian Bible. Paul was quoting from the Septuagint. How ridiculous. I mean, if Paul, we are to believe, was a Pharisee, not just a Pharisee, but the smartest boy in the class, why would he be using a Greek translation of anything? So this is all silly. Or I write about this extensively in both Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Let's Get Biblical, showing all the forensics on this. So what happens when you hear Septuagint, run for your life. The Septuagint that you get on Amazon, incidentally, also includes the Apocrypha, also includes what Catholics believe is the Bible. Really? Like, 
the Septuagint was done in the book of Maccabees. You know how crazy that is? I just want to show you that. I, this, this point just hit me. So the Protestant church believes that the Hebrew canon is the same as the Jewish Hebrew canon. It's the same 39 books that are really 24 books. But other Christian denominations think there are a whole bunch of other books um, that are part of the canon. Catholics call it the deuterocanonical books, like the book of Maccabees, Tobit. Well, Maccabees didn't even occur 256 BCE. Didn't even happen yet. That's how ridiculous this is. So I, I think you, you got to be ready for this. The other point is that Christians will argue that what is the sign if the woman was not a virgin? What kind of a sign was it? I mean, if she was a virgin, had a baby, okay, that's a sign. Where's What's the sign in a woman who's not a virgin having a baby? What kind of a sign is that? Well, the answer is twofold. Number one, and most germane, is the sign is not the birth of the child. The sign is the maturity of the child. Read Isaiah 7, 15, and 16. Before the child knows to reject bad and choose good, these two kings will be destroyed. And ask your Christian friends, tell me, in the, if this is referring to Jesus, who are the two kings? Just ask them, please. Pray tell. Who are these kings? It doesn't make sense. So, Number two is a sign is always something you could see. It doesn't have to be a miracle. In the Bible, we, are, we encounter signs in the book of Genesis. The rainbow, a sign that God will never bring another flood. Is a rainbow a miracle? Hardly. A rainbow, water particles in the atmosphere, light passing through, refraction, colors of the different wavelengths of life, light, are on display for us to see because of this phenomenon. There's nothing miraculous about it, but it's a sign, something that you can see. If it's a virgin birth, it can't be a sign. It could be a miracle for sure, but it can't be a sign. Why? Because in Os, a sign means something that you can see. What would you see in a virgin having a baby? There's nothing to see. Okay? So go back to the original Hebrew. It isn't there. There's much more to this than then I've explained much more. And don't fall for the line that this is a, this is a, prof, a dual prophecy. There were, there's a dual prophecy, they'll tell you. I'm not kidding. Christian missionaries are going to tell you, yeah, the rabbi is not, there the, could be a prophecy where there was somebody contemporarily in the time of Ahaz, again, Assyrian Empire 2,700 years ago. And, but it has a second fulfillment in Christ. I'm not kidding. They say that. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Because if the word Alma means a virgin, which it doesn't, that means that these Christian missionaries are claiming there are two virgins. There's a virgin during the time of Isaiah, during the days of Ahaz, during the days of Pekach ben Ramayahu, and a second virgin in the first century in the name of Mary. Well, please tell us who was this first virgin 2700 years ago this all becomes silly as it turns out in isaiah chapter 8 verse 18 isaiah says explicitly god is using myself and the children who he gave me as sides and portents to israel isaiah's older son is called shar yashiv see isaiah chapter 7 verse 3 matthew has not distorted has mangled the Hebrew Bible, mistranslated and ripped it out of context, not only here, but very frequently, in order to portray or characterize the Jewish Bible as speaking of Jesus, which is a complete lie. People are finding out about this crime. They're, they're observing the forensics of this nonsense and are returning back, Baruch Hashem, to the God of Israel. Let us hope that this Soon we will see the return of all nations who will speak in a pure speech, and we will witness the redemption of the true Messiah quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. I mean, I mean, very good. All right, we'll move on to the next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hi, uh, you talking to me? Yes, this is Eric. 
Hi. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's Eric. I'm from uh, Long Beach, New York. And um, it's a big day for me. I've been visiting for probably six or seven years. And it's the first time I've gotten through. And I'm um, so thankful to the rabbi and to you, William. Thank you, sir. And I relate. I relate to the rabbi. I also was born in Brooklyn one year before you, so I was 14 years after the uh, the Holocaust, but a different neighborhood. But um, anyway, um, my question, uh, I apologize to William, my question is a little different than what I previously said, but I think it's a better question. Actually, do, actually, what we're going to do, uh, I, I, how was I going to say this? I basically had the calls in line based on their questions. So uh, the question that he asked was, was anti-Semitism needed to make the New Testament survive? Was it a necessity to have anti-Semitism in it? That was that was the question. So we're going to go stick with that. Sorry, right, I'm writing all this stuff down so we can keep them in order. So, uh, Rabbi? Yeah, and I hope Eric will join us again because I, I sure want to cover these questions. Is anti-Semitism necessary uh, to the to the early church? And the answer is yes. Um, why? Why is there so much Jew hatred baked into the Christian Bible? So much so that even the the Jew hatred in the Christian Bible is so toxic, so pernicious, and its ability to metastasize is so remarkable as an example when Russia, which the M Russian Empire was a Christian empire under Tsar Nikolai the Second, Alexander the Third, but even after the revolution, World War One, following that, Russia became emerged as a Soviet Union, which was godless and detested religion. But still, the anti-Semitism of Tsarist Russia was retained. How did it? How did it metastasize? So well, so the Christian Bible needed anti-Semitism to explain away a very specific problem. Why don't the Jews believe in Jesus? Why don't the Jews, in general, why are they so convinced that the core teachings of the church are wrong? And I know many pastors, New Testament professors, friends of mine. And I've asked them over the years, what are the questions that you get very frequently from your students, from you? And that's one of the big ones. The question that um, New Testament scholars receive from their students is, hey, why don't the Jews believe this? Why don't the Jews believe in Christ? Well, now... Christians have many ways to answer this question. Here is the way that no believing Christian will ever respond, will never say. This is what a pastor in a fundamentalist Christian denomination cannot say. You know, if it's a Southern Baptist pastor, you can be sure, if it's an Assemblies of God minister, you can be sure if it's an ultra-conservative Catholic, they're not going to, here's what they're not going to say. Why don't the Jews believe in Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because they read their Bible and they draw a different conclusion than we do. Imagine if a, if a so-called non-denominational non church in Pensacola, Florida said that. All these Christian students would go, what do you mean they draw a different conclusion? But the Jews are smart. Moreover, it's their Bible, and they're pretty much the only people who can read it in its original language from childhood. And they were the only people who were expecting the coming of a Messiah. And frankly, they were the ones who were there when Jesus was there. 
I mean, who was in the land of Israel in the first third of the first century? Koreans? No. Oh. Chinese? No. The Jews, they were there. They met him. So what do you mean they draw a different conclusion? And that would be a huge problem. Now, if you were in a really liberal Christian church, very liberal, uh, you were an Episcopalian in St. John the Divine, if you went to Union Theological Seminary, you would have many Christian professors who would tell you that. Because they're liberal. Yale at Princeton Theological, these are liberal Christian um, divinity schools. The professor would very likely say exactly that because they're, they're liberals. They're not fundamentalists. And when I say fundamentalists, I don't mean that it's a pejorative. I really don't. I just mean they're not. They might be nominal Christians, whatever, but they're not. They're not fundamentalist Christians, okay? So therefore, you have to come up with a reason to explain why, explain away the, the unbelief of the Jews. And it can't be that the Jews genuinely have examined the evidence and are unimpressed, and worse, are appalled and repelled by the claims of the church. So what you have to do is say, well, the Jews are evil, the Jews are blinded. That would be a nicer way. The Jews have been blinded. There are scales over their eyes. Paul makes that case in his letter to um, to his followers in Corinth that there's this veil and scales over their eyes. So they they can't they can't see. Um, they have been deliberately blinded because this is the epic of the Gentiles. That has to be, they are the children of the devil. Their father is Satan. That's really nasty, John 8, 44. The oldest surviving Christian literature um, are the, the letters of Paul, the epistles of Paul, which all date to the 50s, with the possible exception of 1 Thessalonians, which might have been written in 49. So it's really early. In that earliest surviving Christian literature, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14 through 16, the Jews are held accountable for killing Jesus, their own prophets, and are contrary to all mankind because they reject the gospel, and they seek to hinder it. So the Jews are portrayed as demonic, satanic. What does that mean? So Satan in Christian literature, in Christian thinking, is not just someone who doesn't believe. It's much more pernicious than that. Satan in Christian theology is a fallen angel, once the highest of all angels, but because of his arrogance, went into rebellion against God and is his chief blasphemer. And here's the point. If you asked a Christian, does Satan really know the truth? So the answer is yes. Christ, Christians insist that Satan knows the truth, but denies God anyway. Not only does he deny God, but he is an enemy of God, and he is God's chief blasphemer, and Satan goes to war with Jesus, and that all ends, well, it doesn't end well for Satan. See book of Revelation chapter 13. So the anti-Semitism in the Christian Bible is necessary as an ad hominem, which means the fallacy here is that if the Jews are evil, then you don't have to explain why they don't believe. Of course they don't believe, because they are the devil. What does that mean, the Jews are the devil? I'm called the devil every day. Why? Because if Tovia Singer isn't the worst person in the world, then you have to explain why he doesn't believe in Jesus. That's where it all comes from. So by using this ad hominem fallacy that the Jews are evil, demonic, under the power of Satan, control the world, the bank, you know where it all goes. 
the reason that's done is so that's a lazy way of defending Christianity from the f- serious charges that Jewish thinkers make when evaluating and criticizing the core teachings of the church. That's where the anti-Semitism is. It's designed to explain away the monumental problem of why don't the Jews believe? Well, if you engage in an ad hominem fallacy, and that is the Jews are evil, well, then you have to explain it. The fallacy is I could be, or Jews could be evil. That doesn't make Jesus the Messiah. Moreover, if I'm a nice guy, that doesn't mean Jesus isn't the Messiah. That's the ad hominem fallacy that the Christian Bible managed to shape, to mature, to fa- to fashion, and that has been the fuel of Jew hatred for 2,000 years. Thank you for your question. All right, all right. Moving in and on to the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. This is Brian Massachusetts from Massachusetts. Welcome back, Brian. I, yeah, no. So my question is about the false prophet in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13 and the correlation in Zechariah chapter 13 because uh, there are false prophets that come in the name of other gods, but then there's also a false prophet that can come in the name of Hashem. And uh, that seems like chutzpah. And uh, I'm just asking how this relates to the end of Christendom, who they... Uh, say that, you know, Paul had the revelation from Jesus and so on. So I just want to ask about the correlation on that. Okay. Okay, let's let's assess those. All right, go ahead and hang them down if you answer. Thank you for your question. Great question. And Deuteronomy 13 and Zechariah oh, 13 are connected intimately because in both of these chapters a false prophet comes into view. Okay, let's examine Deuteronomy 13 because the conditions are very different. Deuteronomy 13 is juridical. It's telling us about law and how to judge and evaluate and assess law. If a prophet or dreamer of dreams comes, offers to show you a sign or a wonder. A sign means what seems to be a miraculous phenomenon. A a wonder is a miracle. A sign is something where he's able to predict the future. Christopher Columbus played that game on the natives. but That's another topic. And, And the sign of the wonder came to pass, okay? But then this supposed prophet says, come, uh, let us follow other gods that your fathers don't know. Deuteronomy 13 continues uh, talking about the your brother, the son of your mother, very interesting passage, because you know you're Jewish if your mother is a Jew. So if it's your brother, It's the son of your mother. This is in Deuteronomy 13, verse 6 in a Christian Bible, 7 Jewish Bible. It doesn't make a difference, really. But here we have how to identify a false prophet. He could do all the miracles he wants, whatever he wants. If he tells you, follow other gods, and this is critical, like other gods, like how would I know if it's another god? How do I know if it's an alien deity? Your fathers did not know anything about it. My fathers knew nothing about the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay? So if your father didn't know, and this comes up repeatedly in Tanakh, go back to the Mesora, to what has been handed down. If your daddy didn't know anything about it, reject it. Miracle signs, there's a reason why I allow that, because it, this leads us to the next question. Why does God allow false prophets to perform miracles. Now, you and I both know that many of these putative miracles are nothing more than chicanery. And that's probably your view, and it's my view as well. As it turns out, the Torah is not nearly as sardonic. The Torah says, 
Hashem allows false religions to produce miracles because I'm only testing you to see if you love me. I, I want to make just tune that up a little bit. The problem is if false religions were not able to produce any kind of miraculous phenomena, we would lose our free will, our Bechira, and virtue would become impossible. If the Jewish people are observing miracles and non-Jewish religions cannot produce miracles, what would happen to our free will? It would be lost. So to the extent that there are miracles around the Jewish people is the extent that non-Jewish religions could produce miracles. In the ancient world, more miracles on both sides. Pharaohs, um, magicians were able to duplicate many of the miracles that Moses and Aaron were able to perform. Why? Free will was necessary. In our time, the miracles we encounter are miracles that can be explained away somehow. So that's why the the pagan world, the non-Jewish world, is able to do something to that extent, certainly produce numinous experiences. Let's now steer to the book of Zechariah, chapter 13. So Zechariah 13 comes into view in a very different context, so you know. The end of Zechariah is messianic, the whole end, 12, 13, 14, all messianic, okay? Zechariah 13, this stage is filled, false prophets come forward when the fountain is open for Jerusalem, for David, which means we're in the messianic age. And false prophets will be exposed at that time. This is the same book where we find Hashem Zechariah 14, verse 9. And that day everyone will know the truth. That's what's very critical to all messianic prophecies. The key feature is that everyone will know the MS. Everyone will know the truth. Okay? So what about the false prophets? So they're going to admit that they were false prophets. They'll come forward and admit it, ashamed. How could a false prophet who has been dead for 2,000 years come forward? That's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. There are many who lie in the earth, who who sleep in the earth. Some will rise for everlasting life and others for everlasting contempt and damnation. So there's the brief resurrection of the wicked as well. In chapter 13, verse 4, 5, and 6, this person comes forward and says, I'm ashamed of what I did. His own parents will recognize that he's a false prophet. He admits that he really should have, instead of the kind of chicanery he was engaged in, he should have been someone who either works with animals breeds animals or someone who works the field is engaged in in agriculture not running around saying god spoke to me and then what becomes peculiar in verse five and six is and one shall say unto him people will notice something very striking about this one individual he might be alive at the time or he might be resurrected based on daniel 12 verse 2. And the last thing will question, Mohammakuseelu ben Yodecha, literally, what are these wounds between your hands? Yad means a hand. Okay. Bane, in between, inside. Why, why do you have wounds between your hands? Okay. That's what's striking about him. And he will respond, those are the wounds that I received in the house of my friends. You figure out who that's speaking about. Is it speaking about Jesus? Well, here's the crazy thing. This is insane. If you're standing up, you probably want to sit down. There are Christian missionaries, and I'm not going to shame them here, 
But there are Christian missionaries who use this, who take Zechariah 13, verse 6, with someone that, what are those wounds in your, um, in your hands? And he answers, those are the wounds I received in the, in the house of my friends. And they say, oh, here is a, a prophecy about Christ. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean, so there are missionaries who take this passage out of context and say, here's another prophecy about a crucified Messiah, it, of course, completely ignoring the context, because whoever that is, it's a false prophet who confesses his sin in the messianic age. And I'll, I'll, I'll go crazier with you. There are Christian Bibles that use this, as I've just said, but strikingly, there are some more honest Christian commentaries that in their commentary understand the problem that this presents and warn the reader in their commentary, in the Christian commentary in Zechariah 13, verse 6, to their credit, they say, no one should ever say this is speaking about Jesus Christ, because if you're doing that, if you do that, you are then saying that Christ is a false prophet. Do you understand how mangled this is? What a crazy world. I mean, you, you, well, you can't make this up. So that's the key. In the Messianic age, everyone sees the truth. False prophets are exposed. Deuteronomy 13 should be coupled with Deuteronomy 18. It's about how to identify a false prophet and a true prophet. Number one, the message must be consistent with what your fathers knew and with Torah. He can't change the message. There's no new mitzvah in the book of Isaiah. It can't be. You can't add to the law. You can't take away from it. Strangely, it's connected to this chapter. I don't want to get complicated, but Deuteronomy 13.1 is different in a Christian Bible than it is in a Jewish Bible. I'll let you look that up and figure out the mystery of how did that happen. I'll leave that, leave that alone. But you can't add to the law nor take away from it Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. So criteria number one, his message has to be consistent with Torah. He can't teach you to follow any other God. Miracles mean nothing, nothing, nothing. Two is Deuteronomy 18. He has to be able to perform miracles, but remembering 13, and that is he, his message has to be completely consistent with Torah. Thank you so much for your question. That was a good question for sure. All right, Color, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? My name is Laura. I'm calling from Ventura, California. Welcome, Laura. Uh, I have a theory about the New Testament I'd like to run by the rabbi. First, let me give a quick non-biblical example of the method I believe Paul used in the New Testament, so you can see where I'm going with this. Let's say a wife accuses her husband of cheating, although he hadn't cheated. So for spite, he cheats and then tells his wife he cheated, but then says he did it to prove her right. He says she can't be mad at his actions because they made her words to be true, that he was a cheater. Now, in the case of Paul, he makes the following statements. He says that the oracles of God were committed to the Jews, but then he says, and I believe he's talking about himself, he says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Then he says, which I find inter interesting, God forbid, yet let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy things, and mightest overcome when thou art judge. And then he goes on to say further down, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie to his glory, yet why am I also judged as a sinner? It's as if uh, Paul is saying, well, if, uh, God's saying we're liars, but then okay that I'm going to lie. That I'm just proving him right, so how can he judge me? It just sort of seems like it's, his, so, in summary, his... your theory is that the New Testament's the New Testament authors intentionally lied on purpose, yeah, not by yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. They intentionally lied. Uh huh. That he knows he's lying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, I don't all know. right. Thank you for your question. All right. Thank you. Go ahead and hang him down. Two uh, your right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. So Romans three. 
the, the mo it's a lot it's a it's a mouthful but of 16 chapters Romans 3 is probably the most important it's kind of like Galatians 3 it's like everything revolves around that Paul is conveying that nobody is righteous and no one's actions could provide salvation and God must be true and let every man be a liar. Paul claims that he has his revelation directly from Jesus Christ, so we move earlier on in, in Romans for that. Paul, in the book of Romans, is addressing a, a church that he will visit but has not yet visited. He's going to set up shop in Rome before he makes his way to Spain. So he's conveying that ultimately the truths of God are, as you said, uh, conveyed through the Jews to whom the oracles of the Almighty were given in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. So what Paul is claiming in Romans is very much consistent with what he proclaimed in other books, and that is, what I'm giving you is directly from God. I can be like, but it all is coming from God, and man is utterly sinful, and man could do nothing to save himself. That's what Paul's conveying here. Paul, if you're looking for where Paul admits that he's less than truthful to his audience, um, first Corinthians chapter nine, verse 20, 21, 22, where Paul lets it slip that he is chameleon, that he can behave like the person he's evangelizing in order to successfully convert that person to Christianity, Jew, non-Jew, law, not under the law. But that's what's really going on in Romans chapter three very, I, when I say important, I say in quotation marks, it's a nightmare, it's a disaster. It's a, it's just a chapter riddled with misquotes from the Hebrew Bible that are shaped, massaged by Paul in order to produce an, an alien doctrine. Thank you for your question. Okay, moving on to the next color. Color, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Miriam from hey. Philadelphia. Hey, Miriam. Welcome. Welcome back. Go ahead with your question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask the rabbi about uh, the Logos doctrine of Philo. Um, a lot of encyclopedias say this is what real early first century Christianity believed, and um, I'd like to know if he agrees and if he thinks that the way Philo uh, explained it is kosher. Mm. Okay, go ahead and hang up now to me for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. really. So Philo, name is Chaim of Alexandria, who lived uh, during the first century. He was born in 20 BCE. He died in the 50s. The reason I tell you when he lived is because he lived exactly at the time that Paul did. He lived exactly at the time when the Christian religion was created and his influence on Christian thinking cannot be understated, was not orthodox, was not traditional. He was a, a Greek thinking Jew. He was a, it's called a Hellenized Jew. And, and it is true that his ideas of the logos were adopted clearly adopted in the Christian Bible, and he had a greater effect on Christian thinking than almost anyone. Now, what does the Logos mean? And the Logos comes into view in the Christian Bible on many occasions, but the most famous is in the prologue of John in the first, teen, first 18 passages of John. In the beginning was the Word. 
that's how the book of John begins. And when John begins in the beginning, he is um, he is plucking from Genesis chapter one. Philo's view of the Logos was completely Greek, completely Hellenized. Hellenized means the same thing. I, I, I was redundant because where does the word Hellenized come from? Well, as it turns out, that is the name of a Greek god and Helen, male, but a Greek god. So I, I want to convey that. It's very, very unorthodox, but... Like all ideas that gain traction, there is a little truth to it. And all false religions sees martial exploit a little truth. There's always a, a some particle of truth, and then it creates a completely false teaching around it. And it is from that little bit of truth that it gains its fuel, it gains its momentum, it's able to gain traction and able to expand, okay? So you think of any myth and crazy lie going on, well, there's a little truth to them if they gain traction. Stuff that just, okay. So let's talk about this term logos. What does it mean? Well, as it turns out, that's, it should be complicated. Why? Because the word logos, Greek word, which means word, just meant a lot of things to many, many different cultures in many different areas of the Greco-Roman world, but it was there. So there's many different definitions of it. What I'd like to do is something that most people don't do, and that is I'd like to talk about what what did it really mean to Jewish people? What does this term word mean in a legitimate Jewish way? And then how did it become a something that would fuel f idolatry, false teachings, uh, dualism? So let's do that. And I don't, many people don't do that. I'd like to do that with you today. I don't think we've done this here before. So when in Jewish thinking, when God, for example, creates the world, well, how does he do that? Now, of course, you would answer, well, God can do everything, of course. But like what what's hap like what happened? Like when God created light, like what did he do? How did he fashion light? And that's the first thing God creates. He or well, God spoke it. He actually, God said, "Let there be or." That means so. This Hebrew word or somehow contains whatever light is made of, and from that word that God expresses comes the creation. Okay, so it's God. God simply expresses a holy word, Psalm 33, verse 6. And in fact, a Jew who fears Hashem, when we eat something like a, an apple or drink a glass of water, the after blessing that we make, which is most important because that's scriptural, the blessing we make after we eat an apple, Bari Nefashas Rabbis, blessed our Lord, King of the Universe, Bari Nefashas Rabbis, Veches Reinon, Al Kol Masha Brasa, Lahachis Behem Nefesh Kochoi, Bruchea Olamim. What we're doing is we're blessing God who created, fashioned everything with deficiency so that he can sustain the world. So God creates, engages in creation by uttering words. This is really important in Genesis as an example, as you can imagine, where we find the record of creation. And then it becomes really important for Adam to look upon animals 
notice their striking character and name them accordingly, individual species, and discovering that, in fact, none of these creatures are appropriate for him, and you know where that goes. So that's where this comes from. So that really is rich. That really is very Jewish. So Hebrew then is, or the Proto-Hebrew very much is, an intrinsic language, and there's only one like it. Intrinsic language means that contained in the Hebrew word is it. As an example, the chemical language is kind of like that. H2O, which is the water, is a is the name of the water molecule, also describes the atomic makeup of a water molecule. H2O. Okay, so we have hydrogen and oxygen together, and that is what makes up a, a water molecule, right? Now, the word hydrogen has, has nothing intrinsically to do with what, that, what hydrogen is, the most plentiful element in the universe. So that, but, but you get it, H2O contains in it it's not only the chemical language for the water molecule, it can molecule, it actually contains within it what a water molecule is. What is it made of? So in whatever way, a Hebrew word in Lush and Hakodesh in the holy language, every the Hebrew word is what was used by Hakodesh Baruch, but the Holy One blessed be to create. So that's that is really very authentic. That's very authentic. That the, that's why a religious Jew, or non just a person who fears Hashem, would always want to use the original Hebrew, not only because you can understand so much about HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his holy teachings by reading in the original language, as you surmised, but actually the holy language is sacred. Because now you understand that the Hebrew language actually contains the Bria. Okay, so that's that's Judaism, and that's very much Jewish thought. That's very simple. It's not complicated at all. Now you go to Platonic thinking, Neoplatonic thinking. You go to dualism. The idea, and this is where it, it shifts dark, and it shifts dark with Philo, it shifts dark and all this neo and that is that there are in fact in the world different powers, and there's the great, uh, the God, let's say in the, in the, to the Greeks it would be Zeus, to the Roman, Jupiter, whatever, they were great gods. And they certainly were way too great for you to pray to. They weren't interested in you. There were lower tier gods that, those are, the, those are the gods that perhaps you brought offerings to, and then even lower gods that you actually um, brought offerings to in exchange for which you would receive whatever it is that this trend, whatever transaction was going down. And this world was basically a, a place that was broken. In the ancient world, people looked around them and they saw broken bodies and broken wheels and broken animals and they couldn't explain any of it. The thinking was that this world was made up of, made by a, a demiurge, which means a, it's the God of this world. Paul makes reference to the God of this world, which is the Lord of this world. It's not a positive thing, but it's sort of a, a lower tier divinity. So in, in Hellenistic thinking, the Logos is sort of a trans, is somewhere in between there, is a transcendent deity, is a, deity that was not the great God, but was a deity that was lower down. And that's what comes through in Philo. That's what comes through in 
all these religions that were just flying um, Gnosticism, later Manichaeism, Marcion's view that the God of this world was the Jewish God who created this inferior world. He's an inferior God and the God of Christ is Paul's God. So that's what's going on. So Logos becomes in a whole wide different range of iterations is kind of something that transcends, transcends men, but isn't quite the father. See? So if you have an incarnation, whatever is incarnated, which means the divine becoming flesh, that's not equal to the Father. And John, the same book, explicitly says that the, has Jesus say that the Father is greater than me. But Jesus is still up there, but he's not the Father. He's somewhere in between. He's a, a logo. So a logos in that view, is a transcendent deity, but it is not the God. What all avodazar, what all idolatry has in common, is it, it seeks to create a deity or insert a, a deity or a, I want to use Paul's term from 1 Timothy, a mediator. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ, right? What That's total Logos thinking, that Jesus somehow bridges the God, meaning the creator of us all, that's the God of the Jews, but there's some intercessor, something in between. And that also spills out in John, where John speaks about the Holy Spirit as a a comforter, someone who's going to be here to kind of work with you um, between, you know, to replace Jesus, not replace Jesus, but to sort of be between, between man and God, the paraclete. It's all this, all this stuff, the paraclete, the logos, all of these things are created to design some mediator between God and man. In the Torah, talk to Hashem. He loves you. To have devekus with Hashem, intimate connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is a mitzvah de'eraisa. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. He, here is, he loves you. He created you. Deuteronomy 32, he's your father. He mamish created you. He wants to talk to you, and he doesn't want to hear from somebody else. You want to hear from your own children, not from someone who sends you a message, forwards a message from WhatsApp to you. And that's what Christianity did, was it created all these intermediaries, whether it's Jesus, whether it's the paraclete, whether it's Mary, who is elevated in Luke, but is really elevated in the proto-gospel of James and by the Roman Catholic Church, where she is worthy of worship and all the saints and church fathers. Well, why do people pray to saints? They believe in God, these Catholics and Orthodox Christians, which make up the vast majority of Christians, why do they pray to saints? Because it's another intermediary. So what it does is it takes something legitimate, which is legitimate, and it bastardizes it, and it inserts something that's filthy, that's avodah which literally means foreign worship, and it uses a term like devar, a word, uh, in order to convey idolatry, right? And that's really sad when you're using something holy, like a marriage, for immorality. That becomes really grotesque. So the idea of a word is very much a part of Judaism, is very much found in Jewish literature. Of course, but this is a bastardization of something that's holy into producing a kind of 
paraclete intercessor. I mean, this is also the kind of thinking of the Menachius that fueled and poisoned the mind of Augustine, who was a Menachius. It's all the same thing. We God is up here, and man is there, and who's going to bridge that gap? So you can take a legitimate idea, and that legitimate idea is that there's a word of prophecy, like when Jeremiah gives a word of prophecy, Jeremiah 29, verse 10, it's called a devar. It's very important. So that is true. That means that's the word of Hashem, a devar Hashem. That's why the term devar the word, which really also ter- very much connect, you know, Daniel, I'm sorry I'm doing this, but I want to just go a little, this, you know, the nations of the world get high by drinking and doing drugs. People who fear Hashem get high on Tyra. Really, this is how a person who fears Hashem gets high. Let's get high. This is the high you get. When it says, from the going forth of the word until the command to rebuild Yerushalayim, what does it mean, going forth of the word, Devar? Now you understand Daniel 9. What word? What do you mean, the word? The word, the word logos just means word, right? From the going forth of the word. Now you understand Pshat. What, what is Daniel, what is Gabriel talking about? That means from the going forth of the word of Prophecy, whose prophecy? Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Now, those of you who are sophisticated know that Jeremiah 25, verse 12, does not have the word word, capital W in it, only 29, 10, because that's from the counting of going back to the destruction of Yerushalayim. And if you go to Ezra, chapter 1, I'm doing this for you, who really want to go and swim in the ocean of Kedusha. This is how a person who fears Hashem gets high. You get high on Torah. Go to Ezra chapter 1, when Cyrus, the Persian king, says we have to now complete the word of Jeremiah. We have to complete the word. Oh, oh, Cyrus says complete the word, and... And Jeremiah is talking about the word of Hashem, and Daniel, or Gabriel, is speaking about from the going forth of the word. Oh, now we understand what the word, word means, but you know this, my, my dear brothers and sisters. You know how people, tragically, could take something that's true and holy and distort it and and violate its integrity and then use that as a vehicle instead of spreading light rather to cause darkness to metastasize there's a day coming that all the nations will worship the one god of abraham isaac and jacob and the knowledge of hashem will cover the world as the water covers the sea habakkuk chapter 2 Verse 14. Thank you for your thoughtful question. All right, very good. We have time for one more, at least on my end. Are you okay with that, Rabbi? One more. One more. All right, here we go. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. My name is Alexander, and I'm calling from South Florida. Welcome. But uh, I am from Russia I'm originally, and I'm a Christian pastor who was actually in jail. Okay. But uh, Rabbi told it completely you know, changed and messed up my <laughs> theology. My question <laughs> he is... He does that a lot to people. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm not just a pastor. I planted actually multiple churches. Wow. And I grew up in Soviet Union, obviously, mm-hmm. and I planted in the United States multiple churches. But uh, now, uh, I'm still pastor, of course, but I don't teach what I was teaching before. And uh, uh, the biggest confusion came from... Uh, Zechariah chapter 8. So at the uh, days of Messiah, all the nations will actually, <laughs> you know, just go after Jews, okay? And they're going to say, yeah, because, you you know, there's a God with you. But my question is, uh, I need, uh, uh, and of course, I, I read a lot. I read uh, Tanya and Torah Or, I mean, all the Hasidic literature, you know, and so on. But my problem is, uh, should one convert uh, to the Judaism, 
R should stay as a Bnei Noach. But the problem with staying with Bnei Noach, I still cannot find the true biblical reason. Not just because, uh, uh, you know, wise men came to the conclusion in the Talmudic, you know, arguments and so on, uh, but what's the biblical reason, what's the roots uh, not to convert to Judaism and still believe, uh, you know, in a one God, oneness of God, and so on. I'm not sure if I am clear or not. That, William, uh, could you, uh, we, my dear brother, would you stay on for me just a second? Um, yes. First of all, it's a, really a an honor to speak to you and to listen to you. I love your words and... It's like listening to your words is like honey on my soul. Really very beautiful. Are you sure that your mother is not a descendant of Jews, given that you come from the Soviet Union? There were so many Jews who became atheists or would joined the Orthodox Church. For whatever, they were persecuted. It was unfashionable in Tsarist Russia or in the Soviet Union to be a Jew. Isn't that possible here for you? Just as a question before we even address this. Well, uh, I know all my ancestry. The, that is another question, actually. I didn't want to confuse you. Uh, my father's side, my grandfather, he was 100% Jew, but my mother is not. And I actually called uh, to one of the rabbi in uh, Kabat Lubavitchi, and he said, no, 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 you're not Jew. So don't even... And he wasn't... So let, let me just say this. Overseas. I'll just say this, that Maybe not, but it's important to remember that you can't know you're not, you know, especially when you come from the Russian Empire. Let's use a word like Russian Empire, and mm -hmm. you're from the Soviet Union. You know what I mean. You yes. know how Jews were persecuted during Tsarist Russia, what mm -hmm. Alexander III was. He was a filthy anti-Semite. Nikolai II, who the Orthodox Church made a saint, what a filthy anti-Semite he was, a horrible, evil person. So Jews who lived in the empire knew they had, if they wanted to go to university, you, they had to lie that they, about their Jewishness in order to gain energy. You know this as someone who comes from that world, right? So you, 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 you can't know she isn't. So I encourage you, my dear brother, to please Pray to Hashem for wisdom. Always ask for wisdom and continue to press. Keep moving ahead and and, and keep looking for your ancestry because it is prophesied in Tanakh that this is a time, the Messianic age is a time when many strangers would convert to Judaism. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Many people come back. So keep looking we have technology today, and that's very accessible. The second thing. Well, I, I did the DNA. I did the DNA test. That's the right. thing. My father's side is uh, Jewish. Yes. But my right. mother's side is not. But uh, I still do all the mitzvot. I mean, I do my tzitzit. I do, uh, you know, all the tefillin and the talit. But some rabbis say, oh, no, 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 you're just damaging your soul. Just, yeah, so here, here's what I would say to you, my dear brother, and that is. On, until you find a reason to consider that your mother, mother's mother, going back, was Jewish, which I don't know if you will. I just think you will, but I don't know. I'm just saying something tells me that they will. I mean, this is not like I'm asking you out of nowhere. I don't know you. We've never met. It's just whatever. It just see. I just get that sense, but just know, you know, you're a smart guy, so you know that DNA can tell you you're not a Jew, can only tell you you are a Jew, can only tell you a positive, not a negative, because the only thing is Jewish DNA, it's just checking DNA against the DNA that's been been collected before. But, so I, I would like you to continue to do that, but, he, it, and you know, you're a smart guy, you know very well that there was every reason in the world, in the Russian Empire, to hide Jewishness, which so many Jews did in order to gain entrance to university, military, higher jobs, being a doctor. You know, I don't have to tell you about anti-Semitism in the empire, either after the revolution, before the re same thing. Okay, But l let me just now 
move with you a little further. Becoming a Noachide, so that's in Tanakh, except the word is not used. The word Noachide is an anachronism. It's just a word that's, it's almost unfortunate. But being a Noachide means that you are converting to Judaism in faith, but you haven't joined the Jewish nation. That's all it means. I mean, what was Job? He wasn't, he was righteous, but he didn't keep Shabbos. There's no mention of him keeping kosher or anything like that. Abraham was the father of our people, but he was a Mesopotamian. So con, a person can convert to Judaism in two stages because Jews are, after all, a ethno-religious group. We're a nation of people and a religion, both. That's unheard of in the world. So there are people who say, I, want, I adopt the Jewish faith, which you have. And then some people say, no, that's not enough for me. I want to adopt the Jewish nation. I I want to be a part of the Jewish nation. That's where the conversion, I think, that you're speaking about. But the seven Noahide laws are explicitly in Tanakh. I mean, when you, you know Genesis 18, when God, mm-hmm. in the only soliloquy God is speaking to himself, says, I've got to talk to Abraham and tell him what I'm about to do, right? And mm-hmm. he says that Sodom is a very wicked city. And Abraham bargained with God and said, but there may be righteous people. And if there are righteous people, no one should ever say about you that you're unjust, that you would kill the righteous with the wicked, right? You remember that? So mm-hmm. what, what do they mean? If there were no laws prior to the giving of the Torah, what would characterize the people of Sodom of being righteous or wicked or what would be a righteous person? How would they well, be righteous? Uh, if I, could I ask you for that, uh, before we go too far, uh, about uh, Abraham? Because chapter 26, Genesis said, uh, you know, Abraham kept the laws and, you know, and all the commandments yeah. and so on. So I do uh, believe for the commandments and the laws, uh, which uh, the Torah given by uh, to Moses was actually in existence before. Of course it was. Of course it was. But of course it my was. question is a Shabbat. I keep Shabbat for over 20 years, being even a pastor and so on. I still keep the Shabbat, but uh, those rabbis say it's not for the, you know, uh, not for the So Gentile. here's, let me explain. So there are different views on this because we're living in an unusual time. First of all, I'm really so happy you're here with me. So there are, Many people who are coming, there are nilva, they are connecting to the Jewish people. So this is, there are different opinions on this. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I believe is the, is what's my opinion on this. If anyone can keep Shabbat, but just keep in mind that one should always say that Shabbat was given only for the Jewish people as a commandment and not for the other nations. So it is not required for someone who just doesn't feel like working on Saturday and doesn't want to because he knows that it's a holy day. Fine to do that, but Exodus 31, verse 16 and 17, says the eternal covenant, Be'niu ve'en b'nei Yisrael. So therefore, what one shouldn't say, and this is, I think, this is my opinion. This is, I think, the consensus view. It's not everybody's view, but it's very clear what's going on here. And that is that one should remember that Shabbat is a covenant between God and Israel. And you could say to yourself, if I am not Jewish, if it turns out that way, then then it's just I'm honoring the day, but I know it's a covenant only for the Jews. And if I am a Jew, please, God, show me. That's That's really what's, a person can say that if that I'm a Gentile and I'm commanded to keep Shabbat. I hope you understand this subtlety. That's what's really going on here. So uh, if, if, if a, a non-Jew puts on sits, it's just wait until you convert to Judaism before you make the blessing. That's really what's going on here. Because is, the blessing is a shekhi shanum mitzvah, so it's hivonu commanded us. That's all. It's really a subtlety. And you know, We've been in exile for 2,000 years. We're messed up. When I say messed up, we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> because this really never happened before. It's prophesied that it would, that Hashem would bring you all home. I'll find you even in the Soviet Union. 
Isaiah chapter 43, verse 5, 6, 7. God says, I will find you in the furthest most islands. To the north, I'll say, give forth the south, hold not about my children. I will bring you from afar. You will go through the fires. It will not harm you. The fires of Soviet Union, the fires of Tsarist Russia, you will not be harmed, but I will protect you. You are a, if what I believe is correct, and I'm not sure, I just, if what I think is likely correct here then you are, if it turns out you discover your mother's mother's mother is a Jew, so you are Baruch Hashem, Hashem found you and, and brought you to him because he, you are a, a member of the children of Israel who is being brought back home and that's why you're on the phone with me on air right now because you love Hashem very much. But, so, but I want to just go back here. So we find that there are mm, the people of Ammon and Moab. So people are required to give charity, to take care of someone who's coming through their land. They failed. And God said to them, you didn't feed the Jews when they came through. So you see that there are all these Noahide commandments all over Torah. Now, it's true, you're right, that Noah knew the Torah, for example. You're right. In Genesis 6 and 7, he knew what was a clean animal, what was not a clean animal. The Torah wasn't given yet, so they were very, very well aware of it. And Abraham was very well aware of it, and you quoted very beautifully Genesis 26, verse 5. The, the holy people kept these mitzvot, especially in the land of Israel. So Jacob married two sisters, which would have been forbidden in the Torah, but he married them outside the land of Israel, and when he came into Israel, it's not an accident. That's when Rachel died and buried in Bethlehem. But I say this to you, my dear brother, continue to search. Turn it over, keep turning it over again. Everything is contained inside. You are so dear to me. I'm just so grateful for you. Please spread the word of Hashem. Don't just keep it to yourself, but let everyone know about the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Spread it all over the world. That's what Hashem wants for you more than anything. Ask Hashem for wisdom and understanding first, before anything. Never ask for doctrine, as you know. I've said it many times. Never ask, reveal to me who you are. Never do that. Never say, reveal to me if Yeshua is the Messiah. Never do that. That's that's how you'll... Find, someone will find themselves in idolatry. Never doctrine, but wisdom, health, redemption, for sure. And yes, there were the commandments that were given to the nations prior to the giving of the Torah. And it is true, you're a smart young men, that the patriarchs were aware of the Torah prior to the giving of the Torah. That's That means... The Jews weren't at Mount Sinai. Whoa, I never thought of that. They very much accepted it then 3,300 years ago when they stood at the foot of the mountain as a nation and proclaimed Nasev and Nishma, we will do and we will listen. God bless you. Please stay in touch with me. And thank you so much for joining us. Very good. Well, that was a good show. A lot of great questions out here. Uh, guys, go to outreachjudaism.org. You'll find uh, the free, uh, well, you can order the two-volume book set. Uh, let me put that image on the screen real fast. And, and, and I'll be speaking in the United States, uh, Dallas, July 8th and 9th. Um, Beynenu.com, B-E-Y-N-E-Y-N-U.com. There, I don't know how many rooms are left. You can sign up for that and join me uh, for a spectacular weekend of Let's Get Biblical. William... You'll be there and yes, many others. Basically, we're going to have a lot of, we're going to have a good time. We are. In a godly way. So thank you so much, William. Great Absolutely. show. Thank you so much. And y'all have a great week. Rabbi, we'll see you soon. Thank you all. Peace. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K. Com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom.
שאיפה 